Yeah. All right, we'll give everybody just a second to get into the webinar. <laughs> I might shed a small tear. All right, don't judge me. <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of mixed emotions here. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine here at Washington University School of Medicine. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents. And yes, I cannot believe it, we are at our last Grand Rounds of this academic year. Um, and what a great Grand Rounds it's going to be. It's the final in our series of the chief resident presentations. And we have two of my favorite co-chiefs, not to pick favorites, coming up here today. Carol's giving me a, what are you talking about, hands in the back. Um, before we do that, I want to start with just a few thank yous. I'll probably say a lot more thank yous at the end, but big thank yous to Dr. Frazier, Drs. Costco, Spencer, to Mark Kahala in our IT department, and Jen Bogovich especially, and Janae Davis for all their help this year. It just simply could not have happened without all of you, so really appreciate you. And thank you to everyone for joining us um, week in and week out to celebrate Grand Rounds. Um, very excited to announce our two speakers today. Uh, as with the previous weeks, uh, we'll have a chance for questions for both speakers at the end. So please send any questions you have through the chat and we will uh, have an opportunity for folks that are present to answer ask questions as well. Uh, first up, we are going to have Dr. Siri Ancha joining us. Dr. Ancha hails from Missouri uh, and went to UMKC for their combined bachelor and MD program. Uh, and then following that, we will have Dr. Christine Auberly joining us. She went to undergrad at Dartmouth before attending University of Kentucky for medical school. They both obviously came here for internship and residency. And boy, Washu is lucky to have them to stay on as fellows in the divisions of gastroenterology and hematology oncology, respectively. With that being said, please put your hands together. Help me welcome Dr. Siri Ancha to knock things off. Great. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. So before we get started, um, Dr. Brian Gage had asked me to announce some of the winners um, from the Mentors in Medicine um, Award Ceremony? I am Symposium. That's what I meant. All right. So um, first up, Preet Shake. Um, one for the oral presentation on coronary calcification assesses cardiovascular risk with similar accuracy and better feasibility than the Framingham score in men with recurrent prostate cancer. And congrats also to Sophie Lewis, oral presentation category, uh, clinician educators' opinions about grading committees in a medicine clerkship. And then the winners for the poster presentations, we have Mary Grace Reeves uh, for state level differences and duties permitted to be performed by medical assistants in cataract surgery. Abby Frederick for improved prep delivery via telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic in a traditional sexual health clinic. Reza Hader for impact of severe obesity on the healing of gastric ulcers. And finally, Marjorie Gang for clinical characteristics and outcomes of infection with human T cell lymphotrophic virus in a non endemic area. So congratulations to all of you winners. I think Dr. Gage will have some uh, prizes for you soon. All right, now to get started. Um, I have no financial disclosures, neither does Christine. <laughs> um, all right, so to bring it to my talk, time to end the stigma around menstruation, period. So why can't we talk about menstruation? This affects 50% of the world's population, yet the stigma around periods persists even in 2022. Menstrual health is a serious and overlooked issue in both developed and developing countries. Why should we talk about menstruation? Often considered dirty, shameful, impure, or a sign of feminine weakness, the myths and secrecy surrounding menstruation have permeated societies across the world. These false beliefs about periods are passed down generation by generation in many cultures. And the first step to breaking this cycle is to be able to talk openly about the subject. Despite menstruation being an entirely normal bodily function, women, transgender, non-binary individuals continue to face numerous hurdles related to menstruation even in the most modern of societies. So this will not be a comprehensive talk by any means. The goal instead is to raise awareness about the inequity and taboo that surrounds periods in developing and developed countries. First, we must define menstrual hygiene. Next, we will shed light on the effect of inadequate menstrual hygiene and the cultural factors have on the precious education of young girls. 
We'll transition briefly to discuss two poignant stories in two of the world's most populous countries, and then bring it home to talk about period poverty right here in the United States and initiatives to change the status quo. Every month, 1.8 billion people across the world menstruate. The WHO and UNICEF combined program for drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene defines menstrual hygiene as follows. Access to menstrual hygiene products to absorb or collect the flow of blood during menstruation, privacy to change the materials, and access to facilities to dispose of used menstrual management materials. There are a whole host of factors that affect menstrual hygiene practices, some of which are listed here. I'd argue that socioeconomic pressures and cultural norms are probably two of the most important. The major consequences of poor menstrual hygiene are reproductive infections and the deleterious effect on education. Missing four to five days of school every month can have serious consequences and negatively impact future socioeconomic status. One major consequence of inadequate menstrual hygiene in these countries is the significant impact on girls' education. A few studies in Africa and India are referenced here, the most notable of which is the study in Kenya that showed that 95% of girls reported missing at least one day of school due to their menstrual cycle. Other studies in India suggest that girls drop out of school altogether after they reach menarche. Though this is likely related to additional factors like child marriage and cultural expectations. Even in developed countries, we see the same problem. This headline for International Women's Day cited that more than 137,000 girls in the UK missed school last year because they couldn't afford sanitary products. So what's the answer to this problem? There's no easy solution given the complexity of factors contributing to poor menstrual hygiene and access to period products and how much it varies from society to society. In modernized countries, the focus of current initiatives is education about periods and menstrual hygiene aimed at young girls. Improved sanitation, provision of sanitary products, and cultural awareness are all necessary to improve outcomes for women. In developing countries, sorry, in developed countries, the primary issue people face regarding menstruation is the cost of or limited access to sanitary products. The UK government recently took a stab at this issue by now mandating that free period products needed to be provided in all state schools across the country. I appreciated their wording too on the government website. Girls, non-binary and transgender learners who have periods may all need access to this scheme, any language, communications, and the ways in which products are made available to learners should reflect this. Now I'd like to transition to the reason that I chose this topic in the first place. Growing up in a traditional Indian household, I absorbed, no pun intended, at a young age, the idea that periods are impure and not to be talked about openly. So I wanted to take a closer look at how these cultural norms play out in the homeland. So what are the factors that lead to poor menstrual hygiene and perpetuate the taboo surrounding menstruation in India? The first is a lack of awareness and education. The majority of Indian girls rely on their mothers to educate them about this natural change but most mothers end up avoiding the subject with them. There's also no standard education about menstruation in schools, suggesting such a change in those societies is often met with disgust and shock. Why would we talk about periods in school? There's also a significant lack of sanitary materials in rural India, which not only pertains to menstruation, but sewage and sanitation in general. Most poor women in India just use the dirtiest piece of cloth they can find because they are taught by their society that menstruation is synonymous with dirt. Shopkeepers don't even stock sanitary napkins in most rural or semi-rural areas due to low demand, largely because these items are so costly. Finally, millions of menstruating individuals do not have access to proper facilities. 25% of schools in India don't have toilets, and if they do have toilets, girls are fearful of using them during menstruation because they're afraid to share the same space with boys and be found out. The core myth behind most of the cultural restrictions during a person's menstrual cycle is that menstruating women are impure. Some activities which are prohibited during menstruation are visiting temples, offering prayers in the home, cooking, handling food, due to the concern that food might get contaminated due to the menstruating woman being unclean, bathing, uh, concern that menstrual blood will pollute water sources as most of these people bathe in um, public baths, 
um, and most alarmingly, touching a cow due to the belief that the cow will become infertile if touched by a menstruating woman. And you know how important the cow is in India. Believe it or not, to this day, I avoid going to the temple while on my period or participating in any religious ceremonies. It just feels wrong. Despite being a woman of science and a feminist, I have a really tough time shaking this belief. The most severe form of menstrual restrictions is menstrual exile. In many parts of India, Nepal, and other Southeast Asian countries, women are exiled from their communities during menstruation. They're often sent to dilapidated huts with poor upkeep, minimal facilities, and limited protection against the environment, snakes, burglars, weather. And the penalties for not complying with this tradition are varied, usually community scorn and financial penalties. They may have to pay a large sum of money if they refuse to exile. Here's an example of one of these huts in Nepal. Let that speak for itself. So another story that inspired me to give this talk was the story of Arunachalam Muruganatham, better known as Padman. He was the unexpected hero who revolutionized sanitary products for Indian women, despite being ostracized by society and even his own family. Arunachalam was born to a poor family in Southern India, later dropping out of school at just 14. Soon after marrying his wife, Shanti, he discovered that she was collecting filthy rags and newspapers to use during her period. He was concerned by this, went to the store to buy a sanitary napkin for her and was shocked by the cost. He started designing his own experimental pads and gave one to his wife to test. Then his wife told him, well, my periods only happen monthly. And he decided that's not gonna give me enough data. So then he decided he needed more volunteers. Unfortunately, no one took him up on this. So he decided to take matters into his own hands once again. He fashioned a uterus from a football bladder and filled it with goat's blood. How did he get goat's blood? Very good question. He was not totally deranged. The local butcher would notify him whenever he was about to butcher a goat so that Arunachalam could go and obtain the blood. He would even add products to the blood to make sure that it didn't clot too quickly in this makeshift uterus. He then put the blood in his uterus and walked, cycled, and ran with it under his clothes to test out his various experimental pads. Unsurprisingly, he was shunned by his village as a result. Uh, he was found washing his bloody clothes at the public well, and most people just concluded he had some sexual disease. Unfortunately, his wife also soon got fed up of his strange research and could no longer put up with the ridicule of their community. She left him just 18 months into their marriage. That didn't stop the pad man. He then supplied some medical students with sanitary pads and collected them after to understand what made these pads work. Unfortunately, his mom came across his research one day, essentially bloodied pads strewn across the floor of their home, packed up her bags and left him too. Over two years later, he finally discovered what these pads were made of, cellulose, and then decided to make his own machine to break this material down. Another four years later, he succeeded in creating a low cost method for the production of sanitary towels. His mission was not only to improve menstrual hygiene, but to create jobs for rural women. He built 250 machines, took them to the poorest, most underdeveloped states in Northern India. Over time, the machines spread to 1,300 villages in 23 states, and they are entirely operated by women. His wife did come back to him after he became famous for his success, and she helped him to continue to grow the business. Can't talk about Padman without plugging this incredible documentary that showcased his life's work. Period, end of a sentence, directed by Reka Zatabji, won the academic, uh, Academy Award for Best Documentary Short Film in 2018. You can watch it on Netflix, along with Padman, the Bollywood hit movie, based on the true story of this incredible man. Moving on from the second most populous country in the world to the first. Pictured here is Fu Yanhui, 2016 Olympic bronze medalist in backstroke. So what does that have to do with tampons? Let's see if this video plays here. No, of course not. Oh. 
我觉得我这样你已经尽力了 so before she could change out her tampon, Fu was trending on Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. People were shocked. How can someone swim on their period? How did she not stain the pool red? Yuan Ren of The Guardian reported that many believe that elite female athletes just adjusted the timing of their period so they don't have to deal with it during major events. If only it were that easy for all of us. Finally, one user commented, haven't you heard of a tampon? Based on this headline, probably not. 660 million women in China and only 2% of them have ever used a tampon. There's unsurprisingly not much concrete data out there to explain this curious cultural trend. Some theories include that a lack of sex education in schools in China means no standardized teaching about menstruation or reproduction. Thus, similar to India, girls rely on their mothers to educate them about this natural change. Unfortunately, many Chinese women fear that using tampons before marriage would mean they are no longer virgins. Specifically, they express concerns that the tampon would break through the hymen. Though this culture is certainly changing in modern times, this obsession with virginity in China has even led to the development of clinics that offer hymen repair surgery so that women can present themselves as virgins to their future spouses moment of silence for that. And finally, the cost. Tampons are two to five times more expensive than sanitary pads, and likely because of the low demand, which leads to limited availability in stores and thus increased cost. And finally, to bring it home, the United States is unfortunately not immune to period poverty. Students, low income and homeless women and girls, transgender and non-binary individuals and prisoners are among those who are the most affected by period poverty. Approximately 60% of those below the poverty line in the United States are women, yet period products cannot be purchased by food stamps or other assistance programs, nor are they covered by Medicaid. In 2020, as part of the CARES Act, menstrual products did become eligible for reimbursement through FSAs and HSAs, a small win for those who have commercial insurance. Yet the problem still remains as those who are most at risk for period poverty still do not have consistent access to sanitary products. You've probably heard the phrase tampon tax thrown around in the media. Tampon tax is defined as the sales tax imposed on menstrual hygiene products, which varies state to state in the US. These products are often taxed at a similar rate as luxury items and do not meet the criteria for tax exemption in most states. As of 2022, we are making some progress to address period poverty both here in the US and across the world. At least 12 states which mandate a sales tax in the US have introduced or passed legislation to eliminate the added tax on menstrual hygiene products. Unfortunately, a greater number of states still have this tax in place. The first graph shows the percentage of value added tax on menstrual products in European countries, from Hungary with a 27% value added tax to Ireland with 0%. Across the world, many countries have addressed period poverty by providing free menstrual products in schools. Shout out to Scotland though, for being the first to provide free menstrual products to all. Within our own patient population, we see the same issues. A survey of low-income women in St. Louis showed that nearly two thirds could not afford menstrual hygiene products at some point over the past year. More concerning, nearly half had times over the past year where they were forced to choose between food and period products due to financial constraints. To give some perspective, let's talk about the sales tax exemption for groceries that exists in 32 of 45 states that have a mandated sales tax. Of the four out of six states that offer a lower tax rate for sales tax, candy and soda are included in the lower rate category, but not tampons or pads. In St. Louis and most major cities in the US, community organizations are working to provide period products to low-income individuals. But since these efforts rely on donations, it's not a consistent option. Periods, though, happen pretty consistently. Dr. Mary Rosser at Integrated Women's Health reviewed the findings from the St. Louis study and commented, these findings highlight just another example of the discrimination and inequities we see not in developing countries, but even in affluent societies. 
Can't talk about periods without mentioning reusable sanitary products. The caveat to this slide is that the choice to use these products is based on preference and may not be affordable or accessible options for all. These aren't always available at regular stores. So some of the options to discuss here in the top right corner, we have menstrual cups. Pros for these are that they're long lasting silicone cups. They can last for years if cared for properly and can stay in for up to 12 hours. Cons, they can shift out of place pretty easily. It takes trial and error to find the right size. Oh, and then a good story that Christine told me recently about one of the radiologists um, at Barnes looking at a CT abdomen and pelvis and finding a foreign body inside the vagina. Um, she got the opportunity to educate that resident about what period cups are. And then period pants and underwear pros, you don't have to buy any tampons or pads. They're rated for absorbency levels, depending on the day um, and how, how bad your flow is. Cons, if you misjudge the absorbency level, it could lead to staining of clothes. And finally, reusable pads. I think the pros here are that they're similar to disposable pads for those who don't want too much of a change. Uh, cons, it can be difficult to wash out blood stains, and when they're saturated, they need to be washed immediately or kept in a bag. I don't know about you, but I don't want to keep a bloody pad in my, in my bag all day. So I do want to comment on some of the progress that we've had at home. There are numerous state bills that have been passed to improve the affordability and accessibility of menstrual care products. Most of these, though, pertain to schools, homeless shelters, and prisons. There are only two federal laws as of April 2022 that address this, the CARES Act that I already mentioned, and then an act in 2018, which requires that free menstrual products be provided in all federal prisons. Keep in mind that was only four years ago. Takeaways. Talk about periods openly with your friends, your family, your kids, your patients. Normalize menstruation and educate and inform the youth well before this transition happens so that they are prepared, and more importantly, that they understand that this is a perfectly natural change. Understand the various cultural attitudes towards menstruation and how these can affect mental and reproductive health. Prioritize the provision of sanitary products in schools in developing countries to minimize the negative impact on a girl's education, which is often her ticket out of poverty and advocate for policy changes to eliminate the tampon tax entirely in the United States. Here are my references. Thank you. Um, first and foremost to my co-chiefs, I could not have done this year without you. Um, to Dr. Costco, Dr. Frazier, all of our med ed staff, um, and to the residents who made this year survivable. <laughs> Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. As I mentioned earlier, we'll have time for questions at the very end. Uh, but next up, please again, help me welcome Dr. Christine Auberly. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so I'm discussing Becoming Oncology, a history of cancer epidemiology. My inspiration for this topic and choosing this uh, topic is twofold. First is a book that I've read recently called The Emperor of All Maladies. Um, it's pretty well known, but it discusses the biography of cancer. It's a collection of stories relating to identifying causes of cancer, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, as well as the socio-political landscape in which all these discoveries occurred. It's really interesting, but also about 400 pages long. So we're not going to dive into all of that today. We're going to focus mostly on causes of cancer and some of those discoveries and how history shaped them. The other kind of inspiration for this talk um, was a grand rounds that was actually given our intern year by Dr. Wendy Wang. She talked about radiation and how it led to workers' rights in America. She told the story of the radium girls, which I'll share briefly, but um, in the early 1900s, when the Curies discovered radium and its many, many uses, it kind of took off in popularity. Everything from cosmetics to put it in the water and your toothpaste, which to, now, to us seems kind of strange now, but it was a new popular thing. Um, one company called US Radium decided to mix it in with paint to create this greenish 
glowing in the dark paint um, and put it on clock dials so you could see the numbers at night. They called this undark. Now they did know about some of the harmful effects of radium, but hired a bunch of young women who were skilled in painting um, and actually encouraged them to put the paintbrushes in their mouths to get them to a sharper stroke to get them to a point. Now, unfortunately, many of these women developed kind of harmful effects from the radiation, including anemias, leukemias, cancers. Uh, it went to trial. The About five women turned to the radium girls, um, sued US radium. And unfortunately, the court case was delayed and many of them were too weak to even collect compensation. But this piece of history was kind of powerful and very memorable for me. Um, and I would discover later, it falls into one of the key areas that I'll talk about today in terms of discovering different carcinogens. So here are the three areas we'll kind of visit the as different causes of cancer and how history shaped them. They are carcinogens, viruses, and genetics. So we'll start in London, 1775 at St. Bartholomew's Hospital with a surgeon named Dr. Percival Pott. Great name. Uh, he decided to um, open up his clinic and notice that there was this disease that they knew about called sootwort, which started, he, seeing, he was seeing it a lot more in young orphans, indentured individuals who happened to be chimney sweeps. Now he had seen this in adult chimney sweeps before, and it was actually thought to be a venereal disease. It was a painful sore with hard raised edges, usually on the inferior part of the scrotum. We would later learn that this was scrotal cancer, but again, they thought it was venereal. So the common treatment was an ointment based in mercury and they were told to go on their way. But many of these individuals got very, very sick as the disease spread. So he wanted to prevent this in the young boys that he was now seeing this happen more and more frequently. He took a look at their lifestyle and started to notice this trend that soot was common amongst chimney sweeps. He said, well, there must be something about this occupation that's predisposing them to this. So taking a look at these young boys, they were often forced to crawl into very tight spaces in the chimneys, often naked and covered in oil to help them squeeze down and maneuver a little bit better. One of these boys said, yeah, I, I haven't bathed in the last five years. He's like, well, it's probably the, the effect of the soot lingering on the skin. So he, he encouraged, you know, sharing his findings and eventually an act was passed in 1788 called the Chimney Sweep Act that said uh, children under the age of eight were not allowed to apprentice as chimney sweeps. And furthermore required that they bathe at least once a week. Now, this didn't really have a lot of effect because it's hard to enforce. How can you enforce bathing and how can you enforce an age limit, especially eight, where somebody who's six or 10 may look like they're eight. So it wasn't until a hundred years later, after he published his findings, that the age would rise to 21. And it wasn't until the 1920s that the average age of scrotal cancer increased by 60 years, which is impressive but it was still pretty common amongst chimney sweeps, which is sad. However, this was kind of the first idea of carcinogens. Previous to this, cancer had thought to have been these bad humors that lingered in the body, this kind of mystical idea. But this was the first thought that some chemical compound might change the body to create cancer. Fast forward a little bit to 1948, a young medical student is on a rotation in New York studying surgery, and he's doing an autopsy with a surgeon. They open up the thoracic cavity, and the surgeon does their examination and moves on. And Ernest Winder, the medical student, takes a look at the lungs and goes, whoa, those do not look great. They're soot covered, they're black, they look horrible, as opposed to the pink tissue that we're used to. But the surgeon seemed to think that this was the norm. 
So Winder takes a look at the patient's history and notices that they smoke, smoked about two packs per day for most of their life. And he says, well, there must be an association between smoking and what this guy's lungs look like. So he returns back to his home medical institution, which may have a little bit more of a familiar facade today, and wrote to the US Surgeon General and said, hey, I wanna study this association between smoking and lung cancer. US Surgeon General said, no funding. First of all, you're not gonna be able to prove it. Second of all, everyone smokes. Third of all, there's a lot more better reasons why somebody might develop lung cancer. Industrial toxins, automobile pollution, infectious disease, even race, much, much more likely to cause lung cancer. Now, kudos to Winder because he was like, all right, fine, I'm gonna go find another mentor to help me out. So he goes and talks to one of the more prominent thoracic surgeons, Everett Graham, who does dozens of pneumonectomies for lung cancer a week. And he says, Dr. Graham, can I take a look at your caseload because I'm trying to improve this association between smoking and lung cancer. Now Graham, as you can see in this picture down here on the right, is a pretty heavy smoker. He said, I don't believe you, but I'll give you access to my caseload because I wanna prove the opposite. So they took two groups of patients, those with lung cancer and those without lung cancer, and did a case control study. Now this was pretty impressive because that was a, a new thing at the time. They found 648 patients with bronchogenic carcinoma and did find a pretty significant association between smoking and lung cancer. So Winder writes up his, his findings in you know, just an average journal and presents them at a, at a conference in Memphis. And people are like sleeping during his presentation and not paying attention. Everyone's like, okay, fine, move on. But across the pond, there are two other scientists, Hill and Dahl, who also have kind of a similar idea. They're looking for a source of lung cancer. They submit questionnaires to a bunch of different patients with lung cancer and those without and did also a case control study because it was becoming apparently all the rage. They included smoking as one of their questions, although they believed that more than likely another explanation was present. Dahl seemed to think that road tar was the more likely suspect. But when analyzing their data, they found that pretty much all of those previous things, smoking, or sorry, uh, food, occupation, travel, all that stuff, none of that had an association with lung cancer, but smoking did. And Dahl found these findings so significant that he actually stopped smoking while he was writing up the article. But still this shows an association. It's not, not really proving causation. The best way to do this would be to do a randomized controlled trial, but that's not exactly ethical to randomize somebody to smoking and see if they develop lung cancer. So instead, Dahl and Hill took a readily available pa patient population, physicians, and sent them all questionnaires saying, hey, do you smoke? How much do you smoke? How long have you smoked? Now, because of nationalization of healthcare in Britain, um, all physician deaths needed to be recorded in a central registry. So what they did is anybody who filled out their questionnaire, if they passed away, Dolan Hill would contact this registry to determine their cause of death. Out of the 36 people who died of lung cancer, all 36 smoked. Now you think that this would be enough to really spur a good movement, but as part of our, our history, um, tobacco industry poured a lot of money into different advertisings and convincing government and even physicians that this research was kind of faulty, not really true. So Winder and Graham also tried to prove that causation was there. <clears throat> they created this smoking machine, which I showed on a couple of slides ago that smoked 100 cigarettes a day. And they would distill down that tar that came out of the cigarette smoke. They would paint that on the backs of mice and they grew tumors. They said, okay, this should be enough evidence. But Forbes magazine in an interview with Graham 
said, how many men distill the tar down from their tobacco and paint it on their backs? Like there's no way that this could cause cancer. It would take almost a decade before the US Surgeon General would declare smoking a health hazard. And unfortunately, Graham would not see that day. About seven years after Winder graduated medical school, Graham fell ill with the flu. He was admitted to our lovely Barnes Hospital, had some imaging done, and found to have an inoperable lung tumor. He wrote to one of his colleagues, Dr. Oshner, who was a strong proponent of this association between smoking and lung cancer, and whom Graham had actually criticized decades before for his thoughts. And he said, Oshner, you know, I quit smoking more than five years ago, but the trouble is I smoked for 50 years. So up until this point, carcinogens have been thought to be the major source of cancer. This was an idea that they called the somatic mutation theory, where some chemical compound or extrinsic factor to the body would affect the cell and turn it into cancer, things like radium and soot and cigarette tar. How that happened, they still hadn't quite figured out. Watson and Crick are just arriving on the scene, so still some more to come, but they knew that this is how cancer developed. But around the time that the radium girls were going to their court trial, new discoveries were still being made. And they thought, well, what if infectious agents could cause cancer? So it all started with a chicken, a Plymouth Rock hen who had sarcoma and a scientist named Peyton Roos. Now, why he decided to study chicken sarcomas, I don't know. I, I actually spent some time trying to figure that out, but couldn't find anything. So I don't know if it was just opportunity, but he started by taking the sarcomas out of one hen, grinding them down and then injecting them into a healthy hen and that healthy hen grew cancer. Now this was not a crazy idea. The idea that something could outside the body could turn a normal healthy cell into cancer was known. But then he started passing his filtrates through filters of smaller and smaller sizes and eventually filtered out the cells. The filtrate that was left behind, he injected into a hen and was like, well, it's not gonna grow cancer, but at least this is kind of proving my theory but yet the hen still grew with sarcoma. So he said, wait a minute, what's something small enough that can go through my filter and cause cancer? He said, it has to be a virus. Now this would spur research for many other viruses that could cause cancer and give us some of the more well-known things we have today, Epstein-Barr virus, papilloma virus, but also spurred a lot of public attention published in Life magazine that cancer may be infectious, developed this theory of the cancer germ. Public actually became a little bit afraid and thought that cancer patients should be quarantined and just like TB patients or smallpox patients. One patient after this publication actually wrote to Roos and said, hey, my neighbor has lung cancer and he's coughing all the time. Should my apartment building be fumigated? Should I move? So that's kind of the public fear that was surrounding all of this. Now, how do you reconcile that with the somatic, somatic mutation theory? One idea was that viruses endogenous to the cell were activated by carcinogens from the outside world. And so that was an interesting theory that Roos proposed. And he would go on to win the Nobel Prize for his initial work around the 1960s. As it would turn out, this would spur other discoveries um, such as the SARC proto-oncogene, which leads us into our next era of genetics. Now this last one I'll introduce with a slightly more, more well-known story of discovery. Just prior to Roos receiving that Nobel Prize, Peter Norwell, a physician, uh, joined faculty over at the University of Pennsylvania. He just spent two years in the Navy studying how radiation influences carcinogenesis. He's really interested in leukemias and lymphomas. And he wanted to see if there was any specific chromosomal abnormalities in leukemias. He found a willing accomplice in David Hunkerford, who was a graduate student at the time. And they started looking at AMLs. 
They looked at hundreds and hundreds of cells, but didn't find any chromosomal abnormalities. So then they turned to CML and did see something rather interesting. They noticed that the 22nd chromosome was a lot shorter. It was missing a piece. So they said, okay, where'd that piece go? And they looked and looked and looked, but could not find it. It wasn't until some technological advancements had been made. And in the 70s, a hematologist named Janet Rowley, girl power, uh, found that missing piece on chromosome nine and found that it wasn't just missing and moved over to chromosome nine, but they had actually switched. It was a translocation. So she looked at a bunch of other CML cases and kept finding this translocation over and over again. Furthermore, it wasn't present in healthy cells. She thought that this translocation could have distinct properties and in fact led to discoveries of the first human oncogene, BCR able. So these studies and the genetic era provided targets for a lot of our therapies, things like Gleevec, trastu excuse me, trastuzumab, which are now our targeted therapies. So each of these eras is important in their own right but they also interplay with each other. And trying to disprove that one era predominates leads to discoveries in the other. They haven't occurred in isolation, but rather in tandem. So it's important to me to kind of know where we have come from to start looking at where we're going. And all three of these eras still have room left to explore. And I'll be curious to see what advancements we get next. I'd like to say thank you to my co-chiefs, Dr. Frazier, house staff, a Carol in the back, and here are my references. Thank you both so much for your fantastic talks and your time. I really appreciate it. Um, a reminder to everyone who's watching the chat, please go ahead and send any questions you have there. I will help relay them to our speakers today. Um, does anyone in the uh, audience have any questions they'd like to ask for our speakers? I'll start off with one for uh, Siri. Um, you know, you talked about obviously in developing countries and in our country as well, the you know, lack of education and available resources in terms of teaching people about this, whether that's lack of sex education in China, like you pointed out. Have you noticed any good resources online, for instance, for parents or people locally that they can access to educate themselves in order to educate others about menstrual hygiene? Absolutely. Um, I actually thought about including a list of resources in the slides, and I should have done that. But um, Global Citizen has a really good review, globalcitizen.org, on period poverty and ways to mitigate that and kind of how to disseminate information about periods um, to those who are not educated about it. And then if you're able to shake off the taboo that surrounds this website, Planned Parenthood also has a whole host of um, educational materials about menstruation. So those are two that I would suggest. Thank you. I have another question for Siri. Um, given that we don't talk about menstruation nearly enough in society or in medicine, uh, outside of OB notes, <laughs> is there something that you think that the medicine residency or trainees could learn about taking a menstrual history as it pertains to the clinical care we provide? Something that they could learn about taking a menstrual So I think the issue is that every medical student knows how to take a menstrual history. Oh, sorry, moving over to the mic. Every medical student knows how to take a menstrual history. It's just a matter of making that happen, right? There's so many times throughout my residency where we're working up anemia and we immediately jump to GI causes of bleeding, but we forget that in a menstruating female, the menstrual history is really important. And it's not just like, do you have periods? Are they regular? You have to really get in depth and be like, what is regular to you? Because for some women, that's every three months. For some women, that's every two weeks and they bleed for seven days. And so um, I think that's just as important as taking a detailed sexual history, which is another thing that we're not very good at doing. So I think the skill set is there. We just need to shake the awkwardness of asking those questions. I see you. And uh, thank you so much for bringing such an important talk because I think, again, we tend to forget that yes, female or women in general can go through things that are not necessarily talked about. Um, 
the study, you did mention a few studies uh, showing that a lot of young female or girls were missing school during that period. Do you know if it was just because of lack of access to um, hygiene products or maybe pain related to the periods that have contributed to this? So um, from the majority of the studies that I looked at, it was more the access to products um, rather than like symptomatology, which I'm sure plays in as well. I have missed a day or two of school from that. Um, there was actually one study where they did sort of like a treatment intervention where there was um, the control, the girls who were not provided with anything. There was another group that got education about periods and sanitary products supplied. And then there was a third group that only got education um, about periods with no sanitary products. And both of the treatment groups, regardless of whether they were given products, had like substantially increased their school attendance over the year. I think this was done in Kenya as well. Um, and so that I found interesting because it's like, yes, the provision of products is important, but also just educating the girls about what a period is seemed to be an impactful intervention. Question for Dr. Harmony. Um, you know, you touched on some fascinating historical examples as we kind of, as a society and world, learn about the causes of cancer, carcinogens that are unknown, to radiation, to potentially viruses, genes. What, what's your best guess for what the next source might be for where we might find a, an unlikely uh, cause of cancers that we just don't have an answer for yet? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of kind of interesting research in like tumor microenvironments. Um, so not necessarily the very initial cause of cancer, but the environment that causes them to grow at a certain rate. Um, so I think that in combination with this era of genetics is going to be our next kind of forefront as we get into things like CAR T cells and all those fun things. Thank you. Anyone else? Present here, have any other questions? Just our coaches peppering us. <laughs> As I recall, all of coaches in attendance ask questions to both speakers. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you notice, Christine, in your um, dive of the, of the historical trends towards public health? That the United States was slower on the uptake than other countries in terms of warning people about the hazards of cigarettes, for example, and also as it pertains to packaging and how other countries are much more aggressive about uh, demonstrating a, like a tumored lung on the box of a cigarette as opposed to here. Yeah, um, that's a complicated question. I didn't find any specific data. Um, I think we all can appreciate the power of U.S. advertising um, and image, if you will, whereas I feel like in many other countries, especially across the pond, um, uh, government and kind of nationalization plays a bigger role. Um, however, I feel like, at least based on my travels recently, smoking is still pretty predominant even in Europe or kind of Eastern Europe. Um, so, I don't know answering your question without really answering it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say in India, like whenever they show somebody smoking in a Bollywood movie, there will be a little like disclaimer in the bottom left of the screen that says smoking kills every <laughs> single Bollywood movie. So <laughs> that's one thing we could try. I love it all. Hi, Carol. <laughs> um, um, I don't really have a question, uh, more of just a comment, thank you. Uh, so much for bringing the, the history. Um, any idea or did you encounter anything speaking on the difference uh, when it comes to the, the epidemiology or presentation of, of cancer in African Americans versus, or any other ethnic group versus um, the majority, which is mostly Caucasians? Yeah, so I think um, unfortunately many of our African American citizens. Um, may live in underserved areas. And so a lot of their cancers are at a later stage, unfortunately, when they get diagnosed. Um, and I think that plays a larger role in at least what options are available to them. And then of course, in our history, they either were unreluctant participants in trials or um, 
were not included in trials. Um, and I think that's, that's something we definitely have to think about moving forward. Um, and at least from a couple of articles I've read recently, um, racial differences and um, even socioeconomic disparities are taking a, a little bit more attention. They're given a little bit more attention in terms of cancer populations. Um, I know that recently I'm working on a retrospective trial and one thing that was noted in comments, they were like, well, there's the, your, your population is mostly white. Um, and so I think attention is being given to it. We definitely have a long way to go, that's for sure. Thank you for that. Thank you both uh, for your fantastic talks today and for all of your fantastic work this year. Thank you once again to everyone for joining us this academic year for Grand Rounds, to our IT department, to our amazing event and staff. We really appreciate it. Please come back and join us starting August 4th. We will be taking a break of Grand Rounds for a little while. And I want to say a brief congratulations once more, like Siri said, to the IM Symposium winners, Preet and Sophie, for their oral presentations. Most of presentation winners, Mary Grace Reeves, Zebby Frederick, Reza Heider, and Marjorie Gang. Congratulations to you all. Thank you very much.